Gabby for being here, and particularly Ross for joining us well. As I mentioned in the introduction, this film was the result of a collaborative and reciprocal process, which is why it's the deepest of honors for me tonight to welcome to the stage some of the people who were in the front seat of this project. I would like to thank to the stage Angel Gates, Joe Dion Buffalo, Ms. Roller Girl, and Dark Simpson, as well as the director of photography, Jeremy Cox. coming down. Um, maybe uh, yeah, I'd be curious to hear both from you and your cast as to that collaborative process and um, in terms of uh, t talking about the stories you wanted to tell, the stories you wanted to share, and um, and how they took the form that uh, ultimately we saw in the film. Um, so as, as you mentioned in the introduction, I've been making short films in and around the Danton East Side with various people that I've gotten to know over the last few years. Here's Mr. Buffalo. <laughs> is Ms. Roller Girl? Uh, there's Ms. Roller Girl. Come on, Ms. Roller Girl. Give a major shout out to Roller Girl. Yeah. 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 Major shout out to Wayne Wapa. Wapa. Yeah. Yeah. And Matt Drake. question is uh, a question about collaboration and reciprocity. So as I mentioned, the, this project is the culmination of several years of short films in and around the downtown east side with people that I've gotten to know and in several capacities as a housing advocate, as a volunteer, as a friend, as someone to listen to. And the, the way in which we arrived at the script was through a rigorous interview process of getting to know people that are featured in the movie, getting their input, throwing them drafts of the script to know what, what they would say in that certain situation. And indeed, this was a film that was actually written when we were making it as well, right? But there was a lot of improvisation, a lot of talented improvisation, I'll add. And going back and forth about what figured in the moment, per se. And through and through, this is a film that was developed through those kinds of moments and that kind of mode of production. And there are... Uh... You know, there are sequences in the film that um, remain from the original short film, uh, Luck Lucky. And time has passed since then. You, you've made uh, a couple of, you know, two short films, and, or three short films in the interim. Um, over that course of time, what made you kind of commit yourself to the original footage from the original film that you wanted to leave in the feature? Uh, I would suppose there were, there were two factors. So the first factor was a very technical one of just which ones fit in the feature. So in, in this version, you saw a dialogue scene between Angel and Eric as to whether or not he has HIV. And in the original short film, the idea was that he indeed did contract that. But in this version, what it figured into was a way in which Eric was actually compelled by the domination of the drug that he chooses in order to do that and solicit that idea to people. And so it figured in a way in which we could convey the way that he is dominated by an external structure, similar to the way in which many individuals in the film are dominated by many structures, right? So that was one reason. The, the second reason was that it was actually just a way of incorporating the past, because there are many temporalities to this film, past, future, and present. I'm sure many of you here recognize the fact that the Woodward's building actually was not built during 2010. 
and yet we set a scene there between Ken and Ms. Roller Girl, and the, the reason behind that was because I wanted to draw a parallax between different temporalities. The idea is simply that colonialism has not ended nor will end until the settler state is dismantled. And so the idea was to draw different parallels between 1867, 1986, 2010, and indeed 2017. Uh, do we have questions in the audience? Oh, woo! Hello. Um, yep, please. I, I, I really enjoyed the film, by the way. I was just wondering if there was any significance to uh, Angel frequently appearing shot in a mirror. Uh, the significance of Angel frequently appearing shot in a mirror. Do you want to take that, or should we give it to Angel? Well, yeah, we'll pass it off, right? What? Let's no, we'll switch it up. Let's we'll switch it up. Because I'm a sexy beast. <laughs> because Angel is a sexy beast. <laughs> um, I think that, yes, the idea was not actually specific to Angel necessarily, though I think there is merit to the idea of the quote-unquote imaginary Indian that is solicited in the media and has been since the invention of cinema, actually, in 1900, when Edison actually tested his first camera on indigenous people. So the idea was to actually tap into the idea of what we think about as indigenous people, but not necessarily just that, but also Canada as a whole, because uh, from my experience during the Olympics in 2010 was not indeed what I saw on screen. What I saw on screen was a very empathetic, patriotic nation, but what I experienced on the street was a compartmentalized and militarized city. And so what I intended to do with the function of screens was to actually create a bifurcation between what we experience in reality and what is solicited on screen. Uh, in many respects, or I, I feel that this owes as much to your last short film, Mirrors, as, uh, as the short that it's you know, based on. Um, we see kind of Eric's reading with his son, um, Angel's story with her daughter as well. Was that a, an essential last piece, uh, Mirrors, the short film that preceded this, to, to, to allow you to tell the, the full-length version of this film? So, as I mentioned previously, this is a film that's featuring real people, and it's about real stories, and it's also about real conversations that we should be having as people. And the, the specific sequence regarding Angel and her daughter was actually directly taken from an experience we had making, making the short film. Um, okay, so in the short film, um, my daughter lives with her grandmother, and um, they, uh, she was supposed to be in the film with me, so we ended up doing um, doing it like separate because my, my ex-boyfriend wouldn't let my daughter come and be around me for whatever reason, I don't know. So we ended up doing it. So my daughter and I actually never had contact uh, through the whole Mirrors uh, film. But it was just basically split up to make it look like it. And it was a real, it was a drama, sort of like this, a docudrama, right? So it was like I was talking about myself for real. And in this film, I am, it's not exact, but they are experiences that I've had throughout my life. And I dedicated the person I play to the murdered and missing women. Joe, so you, in the film, you play Mark, who was uh, another one of the, the players in Mirrors and uh, is not with us anymore. Um, what was, how, how did you uh, convey Mark on screen? What were the conversations you had with Wayne to, to, to embody Mark, if you will? Well, yo, that day is a toughie, man, because, like, stood up. I never met the guy, but I do know if I ever saw him, I'd be like, yeah, he all right. But, I mean, so, yeah, so I have to pretend to be someone who's the best friend of someone who just done died that year. Yeah, major difficulty. Which is why, like, I'm surprised Eric and I didn't fight, you know? <laughs> I was like, yo, this guy's gonna get me, you know? Or whatever. I was just more, it was, like, intimidating. Because, like, I've never been around the likes of these types, you know? Like, no, I have, because, like, I know downtown is it. So, for me, it's, like, it's just more, like, do I have to check him or am I gonna get, you know what I mean? Don't know if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, so all in all, it was just like a, it was a very good experience, and like for that, man, I big up my man Wayne, and I big up the crew, and like cast, crew and cast, man, we, yeah. honestly, we'd be nothing without them, you know, 
sequence that you shot, uh, the fantasy sequence almost. Um, talk about your, your initial conversations with Wayne and, and becoming part of the film, becoming uh, being allowed to tell your stories on screen. Um, good evening ladies and gentlemen. I'm very, very proud to be Wayne and um, I'm just really happy that I fought for other people's rights and I'm really happy to do this and this is my career and I want to move on and make more movies for my fans and stuff. So anyways, I was told to make it nice and sweet. I have a YouTube videos and you can check them out. Um, don't forget to click on the ads. Here's the mic. <laughs> some of the visual motifs in the film. Awesome. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, throughout the film, Wayne and I were always talking about what what uh, what perspective the camera has, and uh, I think if you notice, there's a lot of very, uh, they, they seem like simple compositions, and, and the idea was just to kind of take a step back and look at everything categorically and, and uh, and look at singularity within composition, and that's kind of a, a big reason for the, the four by three, and, and and just looking at the single aspects within, and and uh, categorizing them, and not not letting them get too too complicated and too many points of uh, perspective in individual frames. So what planet did you go to? Earth. Pluto. Yeah. 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 Love aliens. <laughs> so, um, not to bring it down to a somber note, but as you saw during the titles, this film is dedicated to Mark McKay, who was an exceptional person that I had the pleasure of knowing for only about a year um, when I made my. Sorry? We love Mark. We're happy to see you today. We'll see you later. You're damn right, Mark is a badass dude. Yeah. You're damn right. And Mark was a dude who I got I had the pleasure of knowing over a year, and Mark happened to see UFOs, and it's certainly not my position to deny that experience. I was wholeheartedly in favor of listening to Mark and being a friend with him, and if he saw UFOs and I didn't, that's not my problem, right? So what happened was, is prior to production, Mark passed away, and I was stuck in the position of do I fabricate a relationship with somebody from the downtown east side, or is there a way that I'm able to honor his story and his truth? And I had the pleasure of meeting um, Joe Buffalo through Kevin Funk, a mutual friend of ours. And after meeting Joe, the trouble was, well, how do I actually honor Mark's story with the UFOs while also honoring Joe's truth as well? And so the UFO ended up becoming an actual motif of the, the, spectral, the spectral presence of colonialism throughout Joe's life while also honoring Joe, uh, Mark's experience of seeing them as well. So the UFO actually functioned as an interesting parallax between these two individuals who actually are more alike than they are probably aware. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Do we have one more question over? Yeah, Angel. Okay, so something about this feels so final because I've been in so many of your movies. But um, I hope to work with you again because when I met you three or four years ago, and if I cry, I was, <laughs> I was just leaving the industry and I really was struggling with my life to figure out what it was that I, I really wanted to do and I had no dreams. And so it would have been easy for me to just go back. But so when I painted things, you know, like I thought of myself, I thought of myself in black and white. And since you've come into my life, I have hope and I have a dream. And this is, you know, you gave me something to look forward to. And so I made this, which is kind of like an abstracty. And it's not, I mean, I'm not a professional, but so I wanted to give that to you. Woo! Woo! 